Welcome to the Modern CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping accounting firms achieve success. If you're an accounting firm owner who wants to learn how to provide virtual CFO services, then this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's podcast. Um, today's guest is a special one. So um, special for me, especially because um, when I first started at Summit six years ago, um, uh, another CFO was on Tiffany's account and I was came in to help out as an accountant. So I started off as an accountant on Tiffany's account doing some oh, of wow. the invoicing and um, some of the behind the scenes work for her. So Tiffany and I have known each other quite a while here um, because I did work on her account. Um, but we have Tiffany Ferris here from Palantir. So um, Tiffany, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your company. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. It's been six years. Wow. <laughs> oh my, time flies. Um, <laughs> what is even is time anymore? Uh, who knows? Uh, so right. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Tiffany Ferris. I'm uh, the CEO of Palantir.net and um, along with uh, George Demet, who is uh, my uh, cohort. He's also my husband. And uh, we've been running Palantir now for 25 years. And so we are a digital consultancy um, we're based in Chicago, but we operate all over the U.S., and we've been doing this now for 25 years, um, so it's a, been a, a great ride here, and uh, we work to solve you know, really complex problems for a lot of government agencies, um, higher ed, as well as um, healthcare organizations. So, how, how many people are up to now? Sorry. How many people in your organization now? How many, how many team members do you have? Uh, Mid-30s. Mid thirties, wow! Yeah. So growing pretty steady. That's that's awesome. Have yeah, you had? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it's been a really interesting ride. You know, I I I have a rather unique perspective on growth, and um, that I've come to in the last few years. I mean, growth was never really something that um, was an end goal in itself for George and I. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to realize is that. I now see growth as not, you know, we never saw growth as a measure of success, but now I see growth as a potential outcome of success. Um, but it isn't the only measure um, mm -hmm. that would tell us that we were being successful or not. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because that's an interesting concept. So it's an outcome, not, not, the, not the actual driving force, but the outcome of success. What, what do you mean by that? Well, so, I mean, one of the things that we've always talked about is that for us, we think it's really important that we retain the ability to say no, right? That, that, you know, at a certain point when you are solely focused on growth, um, there can become this drive that you need to constantly feed the beast. And that mm -hmm. can compromise your ability to be looking for the right projects or the right team members and in essence that can compromise your culture and mm -hmm. for us you know the experience the experience of your clients the experience of your team members that is what ultimately drives what those who work with you believe and then that determines their actions and for us kind of understanding that 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 cycle continues that's what really drives that sustainable growth and so you know george is a third generation entrepreneur and i like to admit that i didn't have a lemonade stand as a kid so this was not <laughs> what i was going to do at all <laughs> like this is a very unusual uh, path for me i wouldn't have seen it coming um, but for him it's really in his dna um, like literally both sets of grandparents ran their own businesses. His parents ran their own business. He was truly never going to work for anyone else. He is, likes to joke that he is unemployable. Uh, right. So he had to make his own job. Yeah. And you know, so he understands that, that growing and maintaining the right culture is above all the most important thing for him and, and, and for a successful long-lived company. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's something that I've certainly learned from him. And that I think he has learned, um, you know, from his family, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I appreciate that. And so that's, that's really for us kind of understanding that we have to have 
Um, we have to have the right pieces in place before we pursue or even allow growth to happen. Um, it's, it's a really interesting mindset to have. So yeah, sounds, oh, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, I, was, I, want, I want you to expand on that ability to say no, because I think that's something yeah. that mm -hmm. every single business I work with, and even like at Summit, something we talk about all the time. So I'm curious, A, um, kind of why, um, why would you say no? What type of clients would you say no to? And then B, has that changed over time based on your company, based on your culture? Or has it always been pretty something um, you've kind of had set in stone? Um, it hasn't. It, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not been the same over time. And it's certainly... Um, there have been hard lessons that we've learned, right? You want to say yes. You know, opportunity is can be hard to come by, and um, and I also think that there are times when the reasons to say no can be painful, right? You're yeah. especially if the reason to say no is that you're not ready yet. <laughs> Mm, right, right. <laughs> when, you, when you can yeah. see that that otherwise all the other conditions are there but you aren't ready yet <laughs> like that's that's a really painful one um you know i i remember um you know in the 25 years palantir has had layoffs once and okay. that was an incredibly painful moment and uh you know jamie you might remember that one or i think maybe yeah. you came on more right after that but it was really hard for for mm -hmm. me as an, an owner to do and it, it was um and it was because we had said yes to these amazing opportunities and we did them really well um but what we hadn't built as a company was a sustainable engine to support the company at that size at that level because one of the things that we do as a um, as a company, when we are thinking about the experience of being a Palantir is we make a commitment, not just to the person, but to the position, right? We want to think about sustainable growth. We want to think about, okay, even if we didn't find the right person or we found the right person and it's time for them to go to their next opportunity, we want to continue to grow and to be mm -hmm. that size of company, right? We want, we don't want to be a company that scales up and scales down all the time. Mm -hmm. That level of churn is, is different. We don't think of ourselves as an agency. We think of ourselves as a consultancy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, that's one of those kind of key differences. It's one of the reasons that we don't outsource. We're not a nearshore. We're not an, uh, an offshoring firm. We do our work in-house and it's because we build these processes, we build these procedures and we, we really invest in our team in that way. Um, so, you know, we, we had scaled to do these amazing projects and we had three really amazing large scale complex projects, mm -hmm. but we hadn't built the operational infrastructure behind them to have the sales behind them or the relationships with those clients that those would be ongoing projects. Oh, so and they, they fell all off. ended at the same oh, time. Oh, ouch, yeah. ouch. <laughs> and it was a cliff. Mm -hmm. And it happened at the same time that Drupal 8 was delayed. Oh, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and it coincided with the, uh, with the overall shift from uh, of control of a lot of the dollars that, that used to run into Drupal from the CTO suite over to the CMO suite. And so a lot of the decision-making that used to prioritize, um, you know, really technically innovative firms, uh, you know, uh, and, and they would make these decisions on it, you know, who was, who was really the, the most innovative and, and stable technical decisions. Um, you know, really they, they weren't prioritizing the things that we had to offer anymore. So we had not kept up with the way decisions were being made. And so the table stakes had changed um, for the kinds of projects we were looking to do. So we really had not invested in our, um, in, in, in our operations. We hadn't stayed current with the market and it was just super painful. And so kind of, um, and, and, our, and the way that we had grown wasn't um it, it wasn't balanced right yeah. <laughs> we, um i don't know if you've ever seen this uh great animated french animated feature called the triplets of belleville um but but in it there's a there's a cyclist and he's a, a mountain cyclist and and um and so he has 
He's really a great climber. So he has these huge thighs and <laughs> okay. teeny, tiny little wheelie arms. And he's really, really great at getting up those hills, right? And so, because that's what he's built tra- built his body to do is to get up hills, right? Yep. And yep. so in, in a certain way, Palantir was like really built to get up hills, like really great technical hills. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what people needed in the market at that time uh, had changed and they needed more balanced firms. And so we... Um, we were built to do a certain kind of project that uh, really they weren't looking for <laughs> from us anymore. So I had to, to really reshape the firm and that was a painful moment. Um, so I had to, you know, I really had to learn. I had to step back and say, okay, as I think about us as a firm, how do I keep an eye on what we say yes to and, and the impact and the exposure that that creates mm-hmm. for us as a firm and for the people and their families who trust me <laughs> yeah, oh, for to sure. pay attention to those things. Yeah. So yeah, reshaping your firm, I mean, you're reshaping it not only internally, but then you've got to reshape it on the marketing end, right? So That's right. This is the new, the new us. Mm-hmm. How, how did, how, how quickly can you steer that ship and make that, make that change? Cause we have a lot of people that say, Hey, yeah, I want to do this now. How long does it take to do this now? Does it, does it take, can you can you re, can you move that ship three three months, a month, six months, a year? How long does it really take to really kind of fully uh, make that make that transition? Any kind of organizational change takes years. Mm-hmm. Um, we started with an external perception, um, and fortunately, we had all we had we have years to pull from. Sure, and, sure. Uh, that that helps, right? When you have a huge back catalog, you start to emphasize different parts of your portfolio <laughs> differently, <laughs> and that that is certainly an advantage we have due to our longevity. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, and we also had team members who've been with us through that and who weathered that with us um, and through that kind of painful time. And I think that was a that was kind of the start of it. And so um, externally, we were able to to come through, and certainly. The fact that we have through it all remained deep contributors to open source Mm -hmm. has always given us um, not just a community, but a platform as well. And so it allowed us to to talk about ourselves differently. And as we grew into that, into those shoes, I think that was certainly very helpful. Um, So I think externally, we were able to, um, to start establishing that fairly quickly, you know, within mm-hmm. about 12 to yep. 18 months, I would say. Okay. And then that gave us the space to start to think about it um, ourselves differently and start to do the internal work, right? You have to do the external work to a certain extent um, and, and, and start to think about what that does. Mm-hmm. And then we started to use that opportunity as we started to work with those clients to really focus on what the client journey needed to be and to reshape ourselves to match what the client's expectations were and to really match what their expectations were and to be a much more, um, a much more in tuned firm uh, to what they needed and, and to really define ourselves. I think one of the big lessons that I learned around that time uh, was that we had been somewhat of a chameleon as a firm in the Drupal space, we've never really kind of taken a stake. Were we a, were we a, a software firm? You know, because mm-hmm. we did have such an, an outsized role in Drupal, in you know, um, especially for our size, we had a, sure. a, a, an influence on Drupal, the product. You know, so were mm-hmm. we a software firm? So some people, both team members and clients, would come to us because they really admired those chops. So was mm-hmm. that what we were? Um, were we? just another agency because we certainly can do work like that Mm -hmm. um and uh or were we a consultancy where we could do these kind of projects that were really complex and uh involved more than just the technical piece we were helping people to solve deep business problems what were we and i learned through that that we had the opportunity and not just the opportunity but but it was truly down to george and i we had to define what we were mm-hmm. so that people knew who they were 
um, working with and could make that choice. And, um, and sometimes it's a little scary, you know, when you, mm-hmm. when you do put yourself out there, when you define yeah, yourself, then sure. people can reject you and be like, yeah, that's not what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been a really rewarding, uh, really rewarding journey to be on. And we've been reshaping the firm um, internally and going through this kind of organizational change for the last kind of three and a half years has been part of our kind of agile transformation. You know, we mm-hmm. had always done agile in our projects and we've become much more of an agile organization over the last two and a half years. Um, and, I, and I do credit, you know, uh, you know, my relationship with Kristen and, and Summit is a big part of that. Um, you know, prior to really building those relationships, I, you know, I had to run all the, the kind of finance stuff on my own. Mm-hmm. And um, I think what has been really helpful for me is that I get to like stand on her shoulders. I get to ask the questions. I get to go to next level questions. I get right, to think right. about the next pieces and I don't have to, um, I don't have to reinvent the wheel because I will. Mm-hmm. I will, you know, I, I get to give all my spreadsheets over and um, I don't have to build, I don't have to build the spreadsheets. I get to look at the spreadsheets now. And, you know, um, and so that's been really, it's been really helpful and just to, one to have a thought partner, but two, then I can start to think about other things and think about the kind of, the kind of firm I want and think about, you know, how do I solve, how do I solve these kind of big, big picture questions mm-hmm. in a way that's authentic to us. So mm-hmm. You know, for us, what we one of the one of the big driving questions was how do we create a human centered firm that isn't dependent on any one person? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. and um, Chris have been working together for a long time. And so I think you mentioned that prior to that, you were the one doing the finances. So I'm, I'm curious for the perspective of someone who's had the same CFO for, you know, if I was six years, a little longer than six years, like how long did it take you to give that stuff over? And then on a separate question, how long did it take you to trust that the information coming in was, um, was worthy enough to make decisions off of? I gave it over immediately. Um, and, and so there was, tough, sense- wasn't it? was that tough? Or- <laughs> uh, well, I'm a trust, but validate kind of gal. Mm-hmm. So I will yep. trust quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the question is when do I stop checking the work? Right. So I am a big believer in trust and Kristen uh-huh. is such a trustworthy partner, right? That's not, mm-hmm. that's not a, and if, and Jody, you know, Kristen oh, really. so, for 20 years. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I love that. It is yeah. not hard to trust Kristen immediately. No. Um, and, and I think what, I think when I stopped, when I stopped checking was when I just realized that, that um, she started to bring things to my attention before I had noticed. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I just realized it, it happened subtly over time. Um, you know, I just, I, I would realize that I just hadn't gotten to it yet and it didn't bother me. Right. Yeah. Right. And it was just one of those moments that, you know, where I didn't feel like I needed to anymore. And it was just this, mm-hmm. just a release and a relief, honestly, um, you know, for me. And what it did is it, it gave me permission to start to focus on how others might be able to understand what I was doing. So when I was doing it all on my own, all of my effort went into just making the calculations, making sure that we were on, you know, that that the budget was there, Mm -hmm. um, that I was tracking everything. And I didn't have any time. I didn't have any bandwidth left to communicate to anybody else. I was like, yep, we're good. Trust me. That's, that's, that's yeah. all I had at the end of the day. It was like, yep, we're good. Trust me. Yep. Um, and let alone have anybody else I could talk to, to, to bounce ideas off of, or to say, you know, what if we, what if we did it this way? Or what if, what if this happens? Or what about this crazy idea I have? Or, you know, or heaven forbid, like, you know, what if we did this other thing or have you ever heard? Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm now at the point in the relationship with Kristen where we'll model things and I'll say, Oh, Hey, Kristen, what about this? 
you know? Mm. So um, what that's let, allowed me to do is, you know, even pre COVID right. last year, I, I now can do things where I never even dreamed of. I was all up in legislation. <laughs> like, <laughs> last year. You know, I mean, it, it is a CEO's job to work yeah. on the business, not for the business. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I take that seriously. That is what I do. I work on my business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, about half the people in, in the United States work for small businesses. And mm -hmm. if we want to see the kind of progress, we want to see the kind of changes that um, you know, we need in the workplace, small businesses have to be able to do it. Right. And so I take that really seriously. Mm -hmm. I see Palantir as a as an innovation center, not just in terms of the kind of work we do, but also the work we do like as a business. So this is part of how I get to innovate is I mm -hmm. create innovative policies. So part of that is, you know, doing things like making a commitment to a person and a position at the same time, like doing mm -hmm. that's hard. <laughs> like yeah. we do hard things all the time mm -hmm. at Palantir and not just in our technical work, but as a business, we do hard things. And so, you know, I would do things like, okay, well, I did some research. I was like, well, okay, we're going to, we're going to do 529 matching. So I was down in the code. I saw somewhere that Illinois does like offers tax credits for that. But I couldn't get the documentation, so I'm I'm digging through the Illinois statutes to find this to give to Dave. <laughs> I'm like, Dave, here it is. He's like, Where is it? I'm like, Here's the statute, Dave. <laughs> like, you know. And so that's and so then I roll that policy out for my team, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and so then that served me really well when we rolled into COVID, um, because then I was able to say, Okay, I'm going to dig through the CARES Act and I'm going to figure out because as a professional services firm that has its gender balanced at every level across every discipline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the biggest threats to us was, you know, there was certainly a lot of uncertainty, you know, sure. as we looked through Everybody February did, yeah. and March. It was mm -hmm. like, well, okay, one, we have business uncertainty, um, but there's also, you know, if, if we were to get sick and also with, you know, um, schools closing, mm -hmm. um, over one third of my team have small children, myself included. Okay. Was, okay. I need to maintain my team. So, um, you know, George and I, we talked about, um, we called it project, uh, codename armadillo. <laughs> if you imagine an armadillo curling up in a little ball, yeah. that was the vision for the company <laughs> last year. And I was like, okay, people, this is what we trained for. This is what we prepare. This is what our cash reserve is for. And, and so this was the commitment we made to our team. We said, look, this is, you know, we, we do, you know, as many of your clients do, we have a weather report. So every yep. quarter we tell our team how we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I, in, at the end of March, I did a, I did a climate report. <laughs> I was going to say, that would have to be scary. <laughs> like, yeah. Weather is what happens all the time. This is the climate That's report. That's great. This is the trend. And let's look at the really big picture because, you know, okay, we have cash. Like, usually I'm telling you where a cash reserve is at. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to tell you why we ever make a cash reserve and Perfect. how I'm intending to spend it down if I need to and how long it can go because I'm not planning to lay anybody off and I'm not planning to reduce anybody's salary. And in fact, I'm planning to reduce our billable commitments. And I'm planning, because this is going to take a toll on all of us mentally. Right. Right. And, and I'm also really good at digging into legislation. And so I'm going to go dig into legislation and I'm going to figure out how we're going to survive this. And that's what I do because I work on the business. So yeah. you all do what you can do to take care of each other. And you take care of our clients you do that team and I'll take care of the business and we're going to be fine. And we're going to come out the other side. That's our plan. And then we're going to call it armadillo. How did the plan and go? The plan went amazing. And we did. Awesome. So we used, I was like, here's how we're going to use the families first coronavirus recovery act, mm -hmm. um, played paid family leaves. And so I was in there with Kristen and I was modeling with Alyssa and, you know, uh, the PPP, the uh, Paycheck Protection Plan, like we used all of that. And mm -hmm. every day I was in there and every week I was meeting with them and I said, okay, here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to maximize it. Here's how we're going to fine tune it. And our team, you know, we, 
you know, even our lawyer, I had him on there and we were digging into the Department of Labor. And I said, even before they had issued their guidance around intermittent use of the paid leaves um, for childcare, uh, we knew how we were going to do it. We knew how we were going to justify that. And mm -hmm. so we were allowing folks to, to use it to dial down their schedules um, to be able to do hybrid learning. And our team is, in, you know, came through 2020 in a much better place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, last year was not easy for anybody. No, no. It was not easy. Mm -hmm. And, and certainly our revenues were not what they were the year before. Sure, sure. But we, you know, we were, we're fine. Like, yeah. you know, we, you know, we didn't do any layoffs. We didn't do any salary reductions. We, you know, we didn't, ultimately we didn't qualify for PPP round two. Mm -hmm. And we don't qualify for any, we yeah. don't qualify for any ERTC. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We didn't qualify last year and we don't qualify this year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I just, we just did a weather report this week, um, yesterday, in fact, mm -hmm. for our, our company. And I, and I told the team, I've been telling them about these safety nets. I'm like, look, mm -hmm. these are the safety nets that are out there. Mm -hmm. And um, and they knew that I was paying attention to them and that I, I had all sorts of safety nets. I was even looking at state level safety nets. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, I am gonna knit us a, a Scandinavian style safety net if it kills me. Like I'm just gonna knit this from, you know, from scratch. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and I'm like, we didn't need it. I know it's there. I'm gonna pay attention to it, but we didn't need it because of your work and our work. And, but every step along the way, you know, every week I'm like, okay, Alyssa, yeah. uh, okay, Kristen, <laughs> here's my thing, here's my yeah. But I can do that because they, you know, they've got everything else under control, right? Right, and so it's, right. Again, it's like, I get to focus on the pieces that allow That's us important. Yeah. to be yeah. innovating, to be yeah. moving it forward. You know, so that so that I can you know avoid the the pitfalls. I mean, so many women um, and parents have left the workforce um, mm -hmm. because of the strains of the last year. And don't get me wrong. I mean, even even on our team, mm -hmm. We're parents the are on the strain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I do think that the way that we have implemented the leave last year, the way we implemented the leave again. I mean, it was optional. Like I was sitting there on on what was it like right over break because we closed down between um, uh, the 24th of December and, and January every year. Mm -hmm. um, and if I was sitting there, I was watching the, you know, the omnibus bill. I was like, are they going to extend it? <laughs> are they going to extend the speed? <laughs> and they did. And I, you know, I had to dig through that stupidly long bill. I was oh, digging in there. You I was read like, the whole thing? Or you read oh yeah, the I did. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it was funny. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, how are we going to do this? Right. And, mm -hmm. and how are we going to, so I, I dug through it and then on, and then I wrote, I wrote my note to the team and then had Google send it for me like at mm -hmm. 8 a.m. the day we came back so that nobody got it. Sure. You yeah. know, and then, you know, and then how we, how we implemented um, the extensions on uh, our um, we do uh, an FSA flexible spending, okay. and so mm -hmm. there were there were optional extensions for that. Like so, it just felt like I was I was constantly so explaining everything. all yeah. of these things. Mm -hmm. But I'm really good at that now, right? <laughs> so you want to know? I read these bills all the time. <laughs> so, you, know, uh, you need legislation? That, like <laughs> I've got a really good screen on it, but I get to do that. And then I get to go back in and then we flow, we flow it through, but we were, mm -hmm. we were really, it created such a help for the, um, you know, for last year that even with, we didn't, I never went to the team and said, Hey, we're going to cut expenses. Right. We didn't, yep. we didn't make any intentional expense reductions. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't, we didn't reduce any salaries. We didn't do any of those things. We just were, we were doing optimized planning around government incentives. And, mm -hmm. and we also allowed any client who needed to pause work to pause work. Mm -hmm. We were just about taking care we did of people. the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think the, it worked out well. The great thing you're talking about there is, is planning and communication, right? So you, you planned, you planned, you planned, you communicated to your employees, you communicated to your clients. And I think it was a, I listened to the last, you know, couple minutes of you talking here and obviously anybody listening would be super motivated. I think that was a great, great, a great um, present or talking from an awesome owner. And I, I can tell you um, from my point of view, you know, at we do meetings each Friday 
with all of our CFOs and we talk about certain things. And sometimes Kristen will come in with a question and like the second she starts asking it, I'm like, that is such a Tiffany question. <laughs> like, this, is, this is coming from Tiffany or not even, not, not, sometimes it's not even a question. Sometimes it's a, a thought that you had that you gave to Kristen that she's like, hey, has any of your other businesses thought about this thing? And I'm always like, oh, that's a Palantir thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can you can always tell the way the way Tiffany's mind works, and so um, you know we're kind of up against time here. But I, like I said, those last um, ideas you had is really key for any business owner out there. So, any other final thoughts you'd love for our listeners to hear? You know, I think it's just about understanding what your goals are. Why are you why are you running a company? It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Hard things, oh, and remember, at the end of the day, hard things are hard. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, being really clear about um, what are the things that uniquely I'm looking to do and that we are looking to do at Palantir and finding others who do the things that they do with the same kind of passion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you're, you can't do everything. And, um, you know, I think that's where those kind of partnerships. And when you find them, they're super key and yeah. they will unlock it for you. Right. So one of the things I've been, I really appreciate is like, um, uh, Wardley mapping and uh, from Simon Wardley. And one of the things he talks about is you want to be really clear on the things that are, are commoditized or productized and that aren't things that are unique to your business and the kind of, um, you know, CFO support and, and accounting support. We're a, a mid thirties, firm. I, I don't, I really shouldn't build a, as much as I'm interested in it and I love it, I really shouldn't build an expertise in it. Right. And that's yeah, why, right. you know, <laughs> that's why my partnership with Summit has been transformative for us. And for years, I mean, we've only worked together, you know, six, seven years at this point. Mm-hmm. And I, I resisted for many years. I was like, oh no, I can do it. I, I can do this. Right. <laughs> but by taking it off my shoulders, it's the mm-hmm. opportunity cost. Right. What else have I been able to do that is unique to my business, that it does meet my vision for the kind of company I want to run and the kind of innovation as a small business that I want to be able to do because I'm now not doing that thing. Mm-hmm. So every time you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. Yeah. And it's being be thoughtful about the things that you're saying yes to and be really clear about the things that then you're saying no to. Great. That's, yeah. that's a great final thought. Jody, what about you? Final thoughts uh, from just you? Like, wow, this has been uh, <laughs> pretty exciting. I, I should work for you. <laughs> Did we get Kristen off the key? Yeah. <laughs> that's what Jody and I are both thinking I'll, is, how can we uh, take over? I'll come uh, to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's great stuff for sure. I mean, you really took, you, you really took a real scary situation and uh, took the fear out of it is what you did because by taking the fear out of it you found facts you found ways of hey you know we're going to make this we're going to make this work because i think we all run into those issues right where things just hit us right in the face like wow where'd that come from you know the pandemic was one one big one um you know maybe an employee shortage might be another big one and then you took the fear out of it and said hey we're going to figure this out. Here's how we're going to figure it out. Here's what we're going to do to get it figured out. Here's how we're going to pace it to figure it out. And uh, it didn't seem like you panicked. You just simply went on and, Hey, we're going to, we're going to get through this. I'm not worried about it. We've got our cash reserve put in place. That's what it's there for. Um, and we're going to figure out how to get out of it. And guess what? No, no one here is going to get hurt because of it. And uh, you succeeded, uh, which is uh a huge credit to you because I don't know that uh, I don't know how many firms out there would have not panicked um, when, when you did not. I mean, um, that, that's a lot of credit for you. So I'm, I'm real, real, real excited to hear that and real proud of you. And um, yeah, like I said, wow, that's a- <laughs> awesome. Well, Jody, Tiffany, thank you very much. I think this will be a a high downloaded show. I'll definitely encourage all my friends to listen to it. Cause like I said, I, I definitely got a lot out of it myself. So I appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah. thanks. For I'll, I'll encourage show. my only friend to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you both. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, you bet. Thank you. Enjoy this episode. Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving modern CPA firm success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry. 